you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. Welcome back and I must tell you I'm excited. You know, we used to look at the South African Air Force as guys who just walked around. They were looking very busy and uh, we couldn't really understand what they were doing or not doing. Uh, but I can tell you, they were probably the most remarkable people in the entire SADF because they combined, you know, the, the Rambo stuff, if I may use that word, and I'm very careful if I do it, uh, as with, with intelligence, you know, with intellect. And, and that to me is fantastic. And we have one of them here, an intelligence officer, but he had a remarkable career. Chris Coomer, you know, lives in New Zealand. He's a very well-spoken man, I can tell you. And Chris, welcome for coming to the show. We really appreciate you. Thank you, man. Um, it's evening there. It's early morning here in Switzerland. And uh, let's go to your story. Where do you come from? How did you end up in the army? I, I knew you wanted to be a pilot. You tried to be a pilot, but it's your story. Please tell us over to you, mate. Of course. Uh, good evening and thank you for your time. Uh, greetings from a very wet mid-July winter Auckland evening. Uh, I might sound a little sad about it, but deep down inside, I'm actually quite happy because it feels like a good old Cape Town winter evening. So I'm right at home. Um, so yeah, good to be here. And thank you again for the opportunity. I was a little um, nervous and anxious coming on here to share my story. I didn't think anything that I have to share is in range with some of the other speakers that um, you've hosted on here with some fabulous content and almost unbelievable stories that sound like it's come right out of a movie script. I'm thinking in particular to um, recently SW's pieces. Uh, I've been binge watching something stupidly. Um, I've been sitting here in the small hours of the morning with a glass of decent um, red wine uh, or two, or sometimes the bottle just I couldn't leave the screen, man. It was honestly too good. Um, so that being said, I have seen some other content, and I think what I've really liked about this um, about this platform or this forum is, you know, it's people telling stories. And what's really resonated for me over the last few months is you've had a number of um, folk on from the Air Force, a few flight engineers, but most notably for me, you've interviewed, I think about six months ago, um, Jacques Dutoy. And a um, lot, of, lot of the content in Jacques' um, story or narrative I could relate to. And it's actually sort of opened up a few, I don't want to say suppressed, but hidden away deep old memories of events and points in time that he talked about that I can relate to. And more importantly than that, um, the guys talked about names and people I know. And I found that personally quite inspiring. And of course, with Jacques the Cherry on top, he's also made the move across to New Zealand. Uh, he's down in Wellington. And then I've been also watching At Duploy's um, two pieces of content, who's also here in New Zealand. So, and um, he made reference to a few local delicacies and shops that he goes to and places that I can relate to, which are a little bit of a, a piece of home. So yeah, all of that has kind of made me uh, think to perhaps just share a few um, observations um, from my, my time um, in, in the Air Force. So, um, I guess it started with a very typical background, any other, I guess, white middle-class South African living in Cape Town. Um, I was born in 1964 um, for my son on a leap year. So I get a birthday every four years. Um, and oddly enough, I thought that would be a strong case to try to get deferment from national service on the basis that at the age of 18, I was actually four and a half. Unfortunately, I didn't have a good lawyer or the money to put the case forward, but I should have tried. Nonetheless, it would only be a deferment. They'd probably get me when I was 72 and say, hey, it's time, mate. Um, so it <laughs> didn't go. There. But like most of us at the age of 16, second last year of high school, um, we had to register for national service, which, of course, I did. Um, at that point, and in fact, for as long as I can remember, I've been uh, really uh, almost... Um, 
bewitched, for want of a better word, with aeroplanes and flying, and particularly military aircraft, all shapes, sizes. Um, I built up over the years as a youngster a vast library, a catalog of reference books, magazines, and I was obsessed with military history and with everything that went with it. Um, and the context of it, I suppose, came from my father, who um, served in World War II. Um, he was with the 6th South African Armored Division in Italy. And specifically, his unit was um, 1st South African Special Service Battalion, which is to this day still around and has a very proud legacy, not just in that conflict, but in the years to come as well. Um, so mentioned I registered at 16, went through matric last year, 1981, uh, applied for Air Force selection course as a pilot. I did it quite late in the piece because my marks were not that good. So I waited to complete my mock um, matric or final year exams in the hope of getting better results, which of course I didn't. But nonetheless, put the application in because if you don't ask, you're not going to know. And I do recall, I think I got recognition or some form of acknowledgement that they were in receipt of the application and would be in contact in due course as to whether they would consider the application further or not. And I didn't really hold my hopes up very high because the academic side was pretty um, ordinary for want of a better word. But nonetheless, I had my call-up papers. Um, Again, for my son, I got the bad ballot. I got infantry, three Sai, Pochestrum, which, um, oddly enough, was the same place my father went to in 1942, 40 years earlier. Back then, one Sai was, sorry, one um, special service battalion was billeted in Pochestrum. So I thought that was quite an odd coincidence exactly 40 years later, almost to the month. Nonetheless, um, the day arrived, early January, I forget the exact day. It was a Monday that I do recall. And um, did the usual farewell, my family, bit of heart sake, mom having a good cry. Dad drove me to the castle, uh, got there. Uh, it's a bit awkward, you know, sort of, I think my father knew more about what was coming than I did. Um, and of course, there's many tens of thousands of men who will tell you exactly the same thing standing there, kind of, I don't really know what's going on. Uh, this is a bit intimidating. A um, lot of tears, women crying. It's just not a pleasant thing. Anyway, uh, we got marched off across. We had to walk all the way over this bridgeway right across to the other end of Cape Town Station and um, boarded a train for Putsch of Strum, which was specifically just for the Putsch of Strum intake. So it was quite sizable, but I did notice most of the train, or some of the train, the carriages were empty. And in due course, as we chugged along, we'd stop at pretty much every railway siding that had a station on it, and some other poor sap or two would climb on there, and this awful scene repeated itself of mothers and girlfriends having a good old cry. And, um, the one thing I did notice was the NCOs, the corporals, were very reserved and quiet and there was no shouting or yelling or anything really to, to upset anybody. And the trip itself was quite uneventful. Um, it was just the stop start from Cape Town all the way through to Port Chifstrom. And we arrived there the following day, um, late in the morning. And the cordial, reserved demeanor of the NCOs rapidly dissipated as though someone had waved a magic wand and they were in their element. And it was just not so good at that point. <laughs> Lots of shouting and yelling, confused people um, into the back of the Samo 50s, uh, the ubiquitous roof ride. Um, and some of those things you'd, you'd, you were really expecting because you'd spoken to other guys when you were at school who had brothers who'd done it and stuff and what have you. But the first week or so um, was relatively mild. And we were told the reason for it is being from the coast, we needed adequate time to acclimatize. 
because I think Poch is about 5,000 feet above sea level. Um, so the first week was, as I say, relatively mild. It was mainly about um, getting kitted out, going to the stores. Uh, there was quite a bit of medical work they did. We got uh, vaccinations against things and injections and what have you. Um, and a little bit of very basic drill, um, but nothing really strenuous. I think towards the end, we did one or two minor runs, but it was nothing really bad. But then once that acclimatization process was, was finished, which was all too soon, I might add, uh, the rubber hit the road and the party started. Um, and, um, well, I don't need to tell most of you watching this, but we all started to suffer the effects of it. Um, and we really got into the swing of it when um, various units or recruitment elements from various units came around to Pochevstrom. Amongst others, we had um, the Parabats who were recruiting for volunteers to go to parachute school in Bloom. Um, we also had uh, some officers and NCOs recruiting for infantry school for volunteers for junior leadership. And, you know, I'm tempted to say, this is a long time ago, but I seem to think there were a few guys looking for recruits for the reconnaissance regiment, which I thought was a bit odd because they were just roofs. You wouldn't think they would be talking to these guys, but they clearly were looking for interest. Um, and so I thought, well, yes, I've got an application in from the, for the Air Force. I haven't heard anything. It's been nearly half a year, four or five months, and I need to cover my bases. And I was mindful that as an officer or, or an NCO, you had privileges. Leadership had privileges as well as responsibility. And the other element that I was motivated by was the fact that Oatswan, where the infantry school was located, is a lot closer to Cape Town. And I don't mind to say I felt a little homesick. And I thought, that's a plan. I can do two things here. And what's the worst that's going to happen? I could fail and get an RTU, right? Big deal. So we underwent the um, the trial selection, which was relatively time. You had to do a 2,4 in under eight minutes or 10 minutes. I don't know what it was. And running around and do 50 push-ups and whatever was required. And quite a number of us from my platoon did apply and we were selected. And I think out of the, the three site intake, there must have been a good, if I had to put a number to it, over 100 guys who had volunteered. And straight away, we were separated from the rest of the, the line companies. We were put into separate tents, which were um, close to, but not next to, uh, three side, which was actually quite unpleasant because you didn't have the amenities that three side had, but nonetheless, that was the plan. And um, we weren't there particularly long, I would suggest no more than two weeks, maybe even less, when we were told to get our kit together and we were transferring. That's all we were told. And we thought, oh, this is unusual. We're already going to Otsu. It's a good thing, right? And we arrived at Porch Station. They still hadn't told us where we were going. Train arrived and it was a regular sort of suburban train, not like a, a long distance train, which we thought was very odd. And at that point, we were told, okay, you're now transferring to Forsyth in Middleburg, where you will complete your uh, three months basics. And those of you who are still standing, you can go to infantry school. And my heart sank because I thought, ah, oh, geez, what have I done? I've now gone from this place, which is far from Cape Town, to another place, which is further from Cape Town. Anyway. To make your choices and you have to go. So one of, one of the more amusing things was we got on the train and each of us was issued like a little course bucky, like a little food parcel for the trip and one roll of toilet paper each. And on, on the toilet paper, there's a stamp on it which says RSA, which presumably means Republic of South Africa. We were told by the corporals, don't use it too quickly. RSA, it stands for Roll Stardach Af, which in English means use slowly and sparingly. <laughs> so it was a good good thing. But um, good old army, eh? Army not only marches on its stomach, it marches on an abundance of um, toilet paper too, just in case, because you never know. 
And uh, another uneventful trip, we got to Middleburg. Um, it didn't take long. It's only a few hours by train, if that. And um, very quickly, we were assigned to the lines, the infantry um, lines. And it sort of quickly came to light that they had consolidated all of the junior leader intake or the volunteers from throughout the whole country had been sort of amalgamated at this one place. So basically all of the infantry battalions that had a January intake, all of those volunteers had been sent to Middleburg um, with the goal of completing three months basic training. And from there, um, the unit would transfer uh, down to down to um, Oatsun to get underway with junior leader training, which I suppose on one way makes a lot of sense, right? Because you've got it consolidated under one training program. Um, and there were about three or four companies of guys. It was quite a large number of guys who had volunteered. So obviously they'd built in a large um, number of redundancies for guys who would fall out or get RTU'd. Um, and again, the pace and the tempo picked up, um, and it was, I think the word they use nowadays is challenging. Um, but I think in truth, it was just difficult. Um, the pressure was on. And um, I, very early in the piece, started to have problems with my knees. Um, whenever I wore the army boots, with these really thick soled boots, you guys all remember that, and then the standard sort of um, Staldak webbing and Javier, which is, I guess, battle dress. Um, and when I ran, very quickly my knees started to play up. I, I got sort of an inflammation in them. They swelled up, not, not badly, but enough to be irritating. And then funny enough, once the boots and the running around stopped, the pain stopped, so it wasn't too bad. But I, I did take, um, I went to sick bay and I think they injected some stuff in, in there and they gave me Voltarum and bits and bobs. But the offer was made. They said, you can walk away now, take yourself off, we'll RTU to Pochestrum, and uh, you can go to sick bay. You know, get lucht like plichter, like, like um, medical service or whatever it is, like duty. So I thought, no, 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 I'll just keep going until... You know, one of two things happens. Either I make it or my knees fall off, one or the other. Probably wouldn't be a bad thing if the knees fell off because I would have sued them. But anyway, that's a different story. And um, we, so the pace really picked up um, and we got into it very quickly. Um, and about five or six weeks in, it must have been sort of first week to second week of February, they gave us our first pass. Um, and because it was the first one, they gave us a long weekend. I think it was three days. And um, if you were traveling long distance, in other words, if you were flying so down to Cape Town or to Durban or wherever it might be, they quite uh, quite graciously let us go early. Because um, the, the pass, I think, started on the Thursday evening, probably after work, you know, and then the guys had to stand at inspection and if they failed that, um, they couldn't go or they would be delayed until they passed. And that involved two things. It involved doing an inspection of the, the bungalows and um, also um, a personal parade ground inspection. And basically, I just was told to get into my step outs and bugger off. So they, they kicked me out there just before lunch at 12, which I thought was quite a decent thing to do. They didn't have to do it, right? So that was quite good. Um, I just, just sorry, I missed the point. Just to segue back, and I'm sure all the other guys who've been through this will know, um, the days used to start quite early. We used to get up at about 4, 4, 4.30 to prepare for inspection. We would have completed inspection preparation the night before, but it was never adequate and you knew it. I used to sleep on the floor under my bed. Uh, everything would be clean, stripped down, the rifle, the way it was meant to be. Um, and I think we used to get up really early, like the day officially would start probably 5, 5.30 with um, a PT session followed by a run, shower, uh, then you'd have your inspection, uh, which would always go badly, never went well, followed by, um, yes, of course, I don't know how to say it in, in English, but 
um, in Afrikaans, it's an op f sesi. Op f sesi, you know, I don't want to say the word openly, but yeah. Uh, and it was just, it was just par for the course. Whatever you did was inadequate and you just had to take it on the chin and then you'd slope off to breakfast. Uh, so every meal in the army is a parade. You're not able to miss it. You have to go. Um, the food was not good, um, but you were so hungry, you were just grateful, I think, to get anything. Um, they also had these big um, uh, outdoor sort of, they looked like 44-gallon drums that had been cut in half that they used to clean your fight bun or your metal eating plate. Um, but the trouble was if you were late, like, you know, if your company was the last one through the mess or the dining area, um, it meant the water in these cleaning troughs was tepid, cold, be a layer of fat on top that you had to try and clean your stuff out. And I think a lot of guys got quite sick because of it. I was fortunate I never got chipa guts, but quite a few guys did um, did get quite ill um, and had to, again, they couldn't just go, oh, I'll go to sick bay for a few days because if you did, you'd be thrown off the course. So um, it, it was a bit awkward. Um, but anyway, it was what it was. Um, most of the days were uh, a blend of drilling, basic drilling, which was appallingly bad. I and mean, it was so shocking at the beginning. Uh, I was in the cadets in the, in the when I was at high school. We had compulsory cadets on a Friday afternoon, and they used to tell us, oh, it'll stand you a good stead when you go, you know, it'll help you. And counted for nothing. It was absolute waste of time because the whole thing is geared to the lowest common denominator, and it was just... It, it looked awful. I couldn't see anybody could make a fighting unit out of this lot. But anyway, on it went. So a lot of running around, um, uh, a lot of um, running with kit. Um, in fact, most of the memory I can remember is running, just running, 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 running everywhere. Um, anyway, uh, that just brings me back to, to um, I must say one thing, uh, the, the lines, the, um, the bungalows at Forsyth were really good. Um, that would only been built a few years prior. And consequently, we had an endless supply of hot water. And I know a lot of guys didn't have that. But they would you know, have to shower in cold water. And it does make a difference. So that was quite good. But um, anyway, this first um, long pass came around. And um, I remember phoning home, talking to my dad, saying, look, I'm really worried about the fact that, you know, I haven't had anything from the Air Force. And my dad said, I'll look, don't worry, I'll, I'll look into it. And um, I flew home that evening. Uh, I must say the one thing I remember very clearly was how quickly you got a lift. Honestly, I walked outside that camp down to the – the guys were really good. They actually drove us down in a gary to the main road. And we all bailed out there. And cars just stopped almost instantly and picked you up. And I got a lift through to what was then Jan Smuts Airport very quickly. Got home. And my dad said to me, now, listen. He said, tomorrow morning, we're going to the recruiting se recruitment center in Cape Town. I've got an appointment to see a captain there. And she's going to help you. Okay. And um, went into town, went to see her. And she was extremely um, helpful and really professional. And she said, okay, this is what's going to happen next. I'm going to phone these certain people at Air Force headquarters and at Air Force Training Command, and I'm going to find out where your application is. And I may not have all the answers, but I will get back to you today because I know you've got to go back on Monday to, to the Army. And um, I do recall quite, quite clearly my first order of business was I left there, got a train ticket on the train back home, Went home, got changed into my beach gear, grabbed my boogie board, and I went to the beach, and I spent the day on the beach. And I remember very clearly, because I remember falling asleep there, and I slept for about three three hours solid. I was so tired from just basic training or whatever. Anyway, got a dad said, hey, um, here's the thing. You have to be at Air Force Training Command on Monday morning. They have slotted you onto um, the course. Your application was successful. Um, and it appears they have told you that, but the signal from the Air Force to the Army, no one knows what's happened to it. So basically, a, a signal had been issued to say this guy needs to come up for training. But I think what happened is it got stuck at Three Side, 
and me like a kippy because I'd gone to Forsyth, had just thrown a span in the works and it just went into the too hard basket. So uh, Monday morning, my dad arranged an early flight. I think it was the first flight out on SAA. Uh, took the bus from Smuts up to Pretoria. They had a little uh, SAA terminal there, bus service. And um, there was a guy waiting for me from uh, Air Force Training Command. I think it was a corporal. I thought this was quite professional. And they seemed really organized. And um, I arrived there. And there was a large group of um, applicants, um, some in civilian clothes, uh, some or the majority in various military uniforms. And there was on the first day a lot of processing work done for the application. And uh, once the processing work was done, we were driven out by bus to um, the Institute for Aviation Medicine which is just outside Pretoria, close to the N1 in a suburb called Verwittberg. And next to, next to the, um, the institute is a large open field. And it was full of tents, tents as far as you could see, but empty, no one was in there. And some bright wit in his infinite wisdom had called it Tentadorp, which, gee, they must have struggled <laughs> to have come up with the name, eh? but anyway. And um, in we went, and there was a blend of military guys, and then there were civilians, and there were some guys still at high school, who just started this final year of high school, but there was quite a number of guys who were uh, scheduled for July national service intake, who had come up for, um, for the selection course. And uh, things got underway quite quickly. Um, a lot of emphasis on aptitude tests, which I thought I would fail because I thought my school marks were not that hot. A um, lot of medical exams, cross checks, all kinds of things. And quite intense, uh, went on for quite a while. Probably we were there for about a week. Um, and then a lot of sort of interviewing, you know, um, one, of, one of those sessions was hosted by a psychologist or a psychiatrist basically trying to get an understanding of what was going on inside your skull and whether you were a suitable candidate. I think one of the things I do clearly remember was you had to have references, character references. I had one from my school, but also one from our local church, from the, uh, our priest there. So I think that stood a good stead. Um, so I think that'll tick the boxes. And as this process unfurled, various people were let go, should we say. Until And quite a few of guys failed the medical. The medical was very intense. It's not like a normal medical. Part of it was um, we were put in like a, almost like a diving bell, like an air pressure chamber thing. And they take it up to a certain um, pressure, which mimics a certain altitude. I can't remember the particulars. And then they depressurize the thing quite quite quickly to see you know, whether you, you're physically able to, to cope with it. I just remember my ears popping and whatever, but anyway. And um, so the selection course went on and I was still there. I think the only obstacle that really had me worried at that stage was my height. So sort of five foot five is the limit. Anything lower than that, you can't make it. And I, I think I was five foot, five foot five and a little bit. So I was just absolutely relieved that, I, you know, so trying to stand on tippy toes, the guy's saying, stand flat, stand flat. And like he knows. Anyway, so um, eventually I got to, to the final part and there was a, a number of us left. And at that point, it was now a case of going uh, in front of the selection board, which is basically a series of questions that they grill you with. Um, I was fortunate in that I was in the last batch. So we got the word from the first few guys what type of questions they were asking. And they seemed to be very much around current events and who's who in the government and who's who in the military and what's happening in the news, um, as well as the usual thing, which is why do you think you would be a suitable candidate to become a pilot in our Air Force, that sort of thing. So they marched us in. I think it was in groups of three at a time. 
And it was quite stressful because quite a number of those groups were going in ahead of us. When the guys came out, you could see by the body language that they'd been rejected and they were doing it in batches and there was a lot of guys being rejected. So I went in there sort of heart in my mouth myself and two other guys. And um, this is after I'd gone in before because they took you in one by one um, with these questions. And it was quite intimidating. I think there was a brigadier. He was the chief of um, training command of the Air Force, a colonel and a commandant. And I think there was, it was like basic, like a pecking order, maybe a major as well. It was pretty, pretty intense for a. 18 year old to see a rank like that and being asked these questions. I didn't think it went particularly well. I felt very nervous about the whole thing. But anyway, I got called in myself and two other guys and they went, congratulations, you're in. And it was just a remarkable moment in time. I think for the 18 years I've been on the planet, that was probably the highlight of the 18. I was absolutely ecstatic. Um, and so we were told you are accepted subject to the final results of the last batch of medical tests. And that final batch was quite interesting. They did various things where they did brain scans and God knows what else, a whole raft of tests. And um, pretty much everybody went on their way, except for a few of us um, who had a distance to travel. So I, my movement was governed by sort of uh, the availability of the trains. So there was a train, I think it runs from Pretoria down to, probably down to, Miss, uh, not Messina, Nelspreit, I think it is. But it doesn't run every day. I think it only ran every second or third day. So I had to wait till the train left, which was quite nice because, like, we had nothing to do but just, you know, ballast buck, as they say, which was lacquer. So it was a nice break. And uh, got on the train in the evening. And I do remember this. It was an evening late train. And, again, Real SAR stop at every siding. And I think we got to Middleburg in the small hours of the morning or close to midnight. I got off the train and it dawned on me, I've got to walk from the station at Middleburg to the camp, which is quite a distance. It's a good few k's. And I still remember walking through these suburbs, like normal household suburbs, carrying my ballsack over one shoulder and my suitcase in the other. And I got to the guard room. And um, I reported in, and the duty lance corporal or whatever, he was fine. Like, he didn't even bat an eyelid. And um, so I started the trek from the guard gate at Forsyth all the way to the lines, which is probably another, gosh, another kilometre. It's really far. So <laughs> I got to the lines, to my bungalow, and the doors locked out. And I went, what the frick is going on here? So I managed to stand on, on a like on the ledge and look in through the windows. And there was no one in there. It was empty. Um, the beds had all been stripped bare and everything. There was no one there. I thought, this is odd. Am I at the right bungalow? So I went around to the adjacent ones and I looked at several of them and they were all empty. So not knowing what to do, I simply went back to the guard room, slapped the other kilometre back with my stuff. And the other guy says to me, oh, are you with Oatsa? And I went, yes. And he went, well, they're gone. They left last week. You're on AWOL, mate. And I went, what? So they sort of didn't really arrest me, sort of kind of semi-passively ar arrested me and said, wait, yeah. So I slept in the guard room, woke up in the morning. Um, I wasn't allowed out. They brought me food. Uh, I just had to stay there. And then after a day or so, they um, they must have checked out the story. And I was confident it would you know, end out well because it was all legitimate. And... Um, now they had the question what to do, because, of course, the whole company, all of those companies that had been there had transferred out to Otsu when they got back. Apparently, the day they got back, they were told to prepare and then left. Um, and it was quite interesting because that, that whole base, um, Forsyth, was effectively now just a ghost town. There was only uh, a company of Omana who were there, um, sort of like the, the Aka HQ company doing administrative work. And then flanking that, there was the new roof intake uh, for Haka Company, for HQ Company. And um, so I was simply assigned to, to HQ Company, Haka Company, which is fine. You know, that's okay. Got something to do. And um, no disrespect to people who were in sort of the HQ Company, but they were all sort of 
by and large sick, lame, and lazy. So a lot of them were, you know, G four K fours and yeah. So it was quite interesting. There were, you know, there were a few guys who were G one K one, but to my astonishment, I wasn't the only guy on pilot selection. There were three others, which quite was quite surprising. Um, and the three others had come from. Um, other battalions who had been also like me seconded in to Middleburg. And obviously the um, the signal had come through, right? And they sort of cherry picked these guys out. So I don't know how they avoided not getting down there because they went on selection course, but nonetheless they did. So there were the four of us, which was quite good. And then the rest of the guys and most of the guys on the company were designated to become um, drivers or storemen, or cooks, assistants, or you know anything in a support role, which didn't require the need to be physically G one K one. But the um, the training went on, but there was a marked difference in the intensity of it um, and the pace. It was I don't want to use the word easier, but it wasn't as intense um, and. The, the G1, K1 guys, I think, had it rough, but the other guys, you could see it was nowhere near as intense, which is fine, you know. It is what it is. If you're G4, K4, good for you, you know. It's lucky. Um, we were never allowed to wear proper browns. We were in overalls, and the fashion of the day was an overall with a plastic green doiby on your head, which is a little plastic inner helmet. So the, the inner sits on your head, and on top of that goes the actual stall duck or I don't know what it is in English. I'll just call it a helmet for want of a better word, proper helmet. And um, so you had to wear the doiby at all times. You had to wear the overall at all times. And I think the only thing you had on was a web belt with a water bottle. That was it. So everyone knew you, know, you were a rough or a newbie. Um, and it continued. Lots of running around press-ups, push-ups, up for the usual thing, you know. Um, with one marked difference, there was very little emphasis on falcons. Very rarely did we go tree on with, you know, full style like Webby and Javier. Didn't do much of that, which was good in a way. And um, the, gosh, I'd been back maybe two weeks at the most, and a signal came saying that, you know, you were, um, you were on the course, your medical was fine, you're in. So it's just a matter of when and why. And they actually did say you've been selected to attend the next course, which is, there's two courses a year. There's one of, with my year, it was one of 82 and two of 82. So there are two tra training intakes, one in January, one in July. So we were all quite, the four of us were quite, um, quite happy at the news and we were now just really impatient to get out of the army um, and get on with our careers. And yeah, I think at that point, things just become a little awkward. Um, I, um, I think we all felt a little bit above that this was below us. We were a bit above this. We were a bit special. Um, I used to quite enjoy the, the corporals knew the four of us because we were all together and they knew we'd been selected and, and they were quite positive about it. But they used to, like when they called in the lines in the morning to three on or fall in, it's quite funny. They used to go three on, three on, um, signers, drivers, cooks, clocks, whatever, and pilots. So they always <laughs> recognised the four of us. I thought it was quite a nice gesture. You know, they didn't have to do it, but they did. And um, anyway, things went on and the, the weeks rolled by. Um, I mentioned to you that the lines were empty. There was no one in there. And then we figured out why, because I think it must have been early March or so, um, a company of mech infantry came up from one side in Bloom in their nice shiny new rattles. And they were the foundation company for the conversion of Forsyth into a mechanized battalion. So I think Forsyth, uh, sorry, one side were first. And then Forsyth followed as the second company to convert onto, onto Mech. So it was actually quite exciting seeing these rifles driving around um, these Oman up there. They, they seem to take a lot of pride in their stuff. The, you know, the rifles were well looked after. They were always clean. They looked 
in good condition. And I think it was quite nice having them around because you could see things that were different that you didn't see before. And they would be always riding around the camp and they make quite a cool noise with this high pitch whine. And particularly when there's like a few of them, like a platoon or four of them or whatever, it's quite cool to watch. There was no interaction with them whatsoever though. They were in separate lines. Uh, we didn't eat together. There was no no interaction whatsoever with the Omana. Um, that being said, because they weren't there very long, perhaps a month, and uh, they left. And I remember it quite distinctly because I had the evening guard duty shift. We had a, um, a security area where it was fenced with this double security fence. And inside there was the vehicle park, uh, the stores, and uh, the ammunition bunkers, and you know, basically all, all the hard end, sharp end, pointy stuff that you make war with was in there. And of course, it was properly guarded at night. Um, so I was standing there that evening, I remember. It was actually quite cold. I was quite surprised how quickly the um, the seasons change in the Transvaal. I mean, it was probably late March, and um, it was already very, very cold. And on that particular evening, um, I used to stand guard, like in regard to the night, I used to put on a pair of long johns, a tracksuit, my browns, a sweater, a bush jacket. And um, even that was barely adequate. It was really cold. So on that particular evening, I thought I'd be smart. I'd taken a blanket from the guard room. And I was standing by the main egg there by the gate at the security area. There were always two of us on guard duty. And um, I had this blanket on and I had it over my head. Because we weren't issued balaclavas, which which I thought was odd. But anyway, and we didn't have great cuts. I had this thing. On. Anyway, these guys are running around. It's like two in the morning, manning up these rattles and fueling them. And it, it looked like it was something really urgent or serious. And I do remember um, a corporal running, walking past me. He was in a rush. Eh? And he hurled abuse at me, um, saying, I, I don't remember the exact words, but the gist of it, Vadi um, Efstan Yesua. Which loosely translates, what the f are you doing with a blanket on your head? You look like an effing Arab. Which is just so wrong on so many levels, you know? But anyway, it's all good. And um, off they went, eh? the middle of the middle of the night, this convoy of rattles and supporting samples and are gone. And they never came back. So I assume they must have gone up to the operational area and basically Forsyth became a ghost town again. Um, so now we're into probably April. Um, I mentioned to you that sort of the pace and the tone of the, the training didn't seem as intense, but it was still, you know, it was still a difficult time. It certainly wasn't a party. We would go to the shooting range, I think, every second week. We didn't go every week, every second week, which was quite mercifully a good thing because we did very little shooting on the range we did a lot of running and push-ups and all kinds of horrible things so it didn't really bug me at all but um on one particular occasion i went there and um it was a hard day it was a bad day that just really gave us a tough time worse than normal and i was on the line um and we were, you know, doing our, sh our, our musketry or firing. And they, I think they normally issued you only five rounds. Like they'd go five rounds, five two passing, op your air take, op your air take and skip. I don't want to do it in English. I don't know what it, anyway, just shoot at your target, fire. And on the R4, it's got like the top, it says an S for safety, then it's got an A for automatic and then an R for rapid. And oddly R is, Rapid is actually single shot, which is what you're supposed to be doing. And if you're not paying attention, you can get that A button on, in which case it doesn't go boof, boof, boof. It goes brrr, yeah, like a machine gun. Anyway, some freaking sap on the firing line added on A. And I just remember, it just, you know, A at date, gone on. And I remember laughing to myself thinking, yeah, I don't know who you are. But you're in for a shit time. It's going to come down there. And I just squeezed off my five rounds and stark fear and the usual thing. And then the corporal comes up and, like, I don't know how they did it, but they identified either me or this guy next to me as being the guilty parties for inadvertently ripping off an automatic burst. 
And I know it wasn't me because I remember laughing to myself thinking, ah, this oak's in trouble and everything. And the guy next to me was one of these G4K4 guys. So he was so sweared flatly it wasn't him. And in fairness to the guy, it may not have been. I don't know. I just don't know how they made the selection out of 30 or 40 guys on the firing line. It was us anyway. So the G4K4 guy got, he was told, you're getting lines. You have to write out a thousand times. I will not fire my rifle on automatic or whatever. And they said for me, okay, well, for you, here's a case of 5.56 ammo. Take that, your rifle. And I think we were on the 100-meter marker. I can't remember. Let's run to the 500-meter marker and come back. And um, I was not in a great state. I was feeling it a bit. It was hot. I'd been running around already. And um, off I went trying to carry this box. And it's not a very practical thing to carry, particularly with the rifle, because you don't. we didn't have rifle straps. You couldn't sling the weapon over your back. So I tried to jimmy the rifle in the webbing, and that didn't work. And then I tried to put it between the ropes on the thing, and it's falling off. And I must have got it best halfway. And then something within me just snapped. And I just went, I'm not doing this. I am not going to do this. And I just put down the ammo case. And I remember sitting down on it. And I thought, what are they going to do? What are they going to do to me? I'm not even meant to be here. I was meant to be in the Air Force. And I, it was almost like a moment of anger, which is quite out of my character. I'm not really that way inclined. But anyway, it's how I felt. And um, Instantly, the Gary came racing up with a corporal and he hurled abuse and obscenities at me and threw the ammo case in the back of the Gary and he rode back and I was told to run back with my rifle above my head, and which I did to the best of my ability. And, you know, basically there was more running after that and, and the day ended and we thought, okay, we'll get in the sawmills, the troop carriers and go back and then. In the back of the sawmills, um, I think it was a sawmill 100 there, a flatbed they brought in, and, and it was full of dark poles. I just knew instantly what this meant. And we were basically put two guys onto a pole, and we were told, you're going to run back from here to the main road, on the gravel road, and from there the troop carriers will take you back, which is like it's a couple of kilometres. And I just went, there is no way I'm going to do this. I can't. I physically am finished. And funny enough, the other guy on the pole, they, they were really good about it. They always made sure that the heights were the same, you know, so that you couldn't, you know, lose momentum. And the other guy, can I mention names on this? Is it all right? It's not in a bad bad way. It is okay. Uh, he's a wonderful guy. Um, he's a gentleman name of Rodney King. I know he's a weird surname, Rodney King, right? But that's his name. Um, so Rodney, like me, he, he was one of the pilot um, uh, trainees to go in and just by side note Rodney is still in the Air Force I don't know if you're watching this mate I hope you are well uh, he's a senior colonel at Air Force headquarters uh, he's done very well in his career um, really good guy uh, anyway Roger was in I think Rodney was by him and I was in the front and off we went and I thought well I better do the best I can you know it's, it's, everyone else is trying and this went on, and there was just no end to it. Go to this bush, go to that tree, go around this, go around that. And I just thought, nah, enough. I wasn't feeling well. I actually felt sick. I was weak on my legs. My knees were in agony, and I just went, I've had enough. So I just fell over, and I just wouldn't get up. And so I remember the corporal coming up to me, and he picked me up by the back of my webbing, and I just I just hung there. I just pretended I'd passed out. I was just, I'm not going to do it. Um. And they picked me up and put me in again in the back of the Gary. And um, this is where the serious bit comes in because I woke up the next morning in sick bay, and I have no recollection other than getting into the back of that Gary and waking up the next morning. And I woke up quite early; it was just like dawn or whatever. And then at eight o'clock, I think the doctor came around doing the rounds and. Um, I noticed I had a drip in my arm and he said to me, you're actually quite badly dehydrated. Why aren't you drinking water? And it never really occurred to me. I thought I was, but he said, you actually are quite dehydrated. So, um, yeah, the part of me falling over whilst, you know, I consciously did it, there is some truth in it that I was probably close to my end. And I just remember my knees were like I was in agony, man, really painful. 
So um, I think I spent the day for observation in sickbay. I was immediately put onto light duty and I reported the following morning to the company HQ, to the Sergeant Major, the CSM. And um, I was told to immediately write a letter home explaining what had happened to me, that I was fine and that I was not you know, in any way injured or anything like that. That's fine. I don't mind. I did what I was told. And I got a week's light duty out of it, which was awesome. Uh, my knees recovered. That was good. And then um, sort of basics was still going on, but it was um, it was an odd time. It was like losing its momentum. And it sort of, it, it didn't come to a hard cutoff. It didn't like have at the end of March, that's 13 weeks and you're done. It just sort of, for want of a better phrase, fizzled out. And um, they still kept us doing various tasks, but the emphasis of it changed. A lot of it was spent on sort of base maintenance. So we found ourselves doing, you know, normally on a Saturday morning in the infantry, you do in, um, base maintenance, like chicken parade and things. We seem to be doing it every second day. And it was a lot more expanded. So stuff like sort of they give you a shovel and you have to go scuffle the grass out and the felt next to the road. And, and a lot of actually working on the road because all the roads were, were um, they were gravel. There's only one tied road around there. You seem to always be out there fixing the road, which seems an odd thing to be doing. And then just normally a lot of drill, run, uh, a lot of marching and light PT and whatever. But no one was really sure whether basics really was over or not. Um, and at about that time, uh, we were also doing a lot of like stores work, like moving stores around or whatever. You know, we were in the armory and I think they probably wanted us to shift some stores. And there were about, I don't know, maybe 10 of us 20 of us, I don't know. Uh, we were standing there and sleeping around and a corporal came past and he, no one did anything and he picked on me and berated me for not bringing the squad to attention, you know, what have you. And I think it was just bad luck that I caught his line of sight that he chose to pick on me. But I, um, I wasn't happy. I, I just thought, this is really unfair. Why? Well, you know, I didn't say anything, of course, but I just thought, you know, and it was quite, it was quite nasty. It wasn't like, you know, it was like, you know, the usual thing. I'm sure many people can understand what I'm relating to, the kind of language he used. Anyway, he turned his back and as he walked away with um, a, a degree of impertinence and disrespect that I do regret and I should not have done it, I gave him the bird, you know, the finger to his back. And as I did it, I just remember from across the small parade room, I just did this, Oi! What do you do? What are you doing there? And the corporal pivoted as well because he heard the shouting and he came back. And it was another corporal. And he said, Stand fast, stand fast. He said, Vice for the corporal, what you do it. He said to me, Show the corporal what you just did. And I very sheepishly did it. And I, I, due to this day, it's 40 years later, but I remember the look on the son of a bitch's face and he just, like his face just lightened up with joy. Like it was the best thing, like he'd been given the best Christmas present ever that he's caught this trippy being a little shit. Anyway, um, long story short, they said to me, you must report to um, the staff sergeant who was in command of the motor pool for, um, let's say, correctional correctional PT training at four o'clock or 4.30 at the end of the day. And I was to report there in Browns uh, with a T-shirt, my boots and everything, T-shirt. And I knew instantly what was going to happen. So they, they had a thing called doggies. And doggies was a disciplinary procedure where they took a sawmill tire, I think from a sawmill 100, and they had a rope harness that you had to obviously put the harness on and run towing this tire, which is you know, really, really tough going. I'd seen really big guys struggling with it before. So I knew what was coming and I just thought, well, you know, you did a stupid thing and now you can just deal with the consequences and just take it on the chin. So I went in there and the staff sergeant there, he was a flippant monster of a man, over six foot. He had para wings. He was a paratrooper. Um, 
probably massively disgruntled that he had this crappy job being in charge of the motor pool. So probably had a chip on his shoulder and just, yeah, I walked in there and he basically, you know, he said to an Afrikaans, oh, are you, are you one of those four pilots? Like he knew where I was. So I said to him, yeah, stuff, yes, stuff. And, and he said, oh, I've got a surprise for you. We're going to go do some airplane PT. And I thought, oh, I wonder what that is. And I found out soon enough. So basically, him and I, off we went in the security fence. And essentially, we ran. And every time he blew the whistle, I had to dive into the dirt. And um, yeah, we did this, I don't know for how long, but round and around the security fence we went. There seemed to be no end to it. And uh, I don't know, after some time, it stopped. And um, he basically gave me another verbal berating, which is fine. I had it coming. And I slapped off feeling sorry for myself back to the lines. Um, but I'd come out a bit worse for wear because the, the actual the, the security fence in between, it's not like nicely manicured grass. It's just dirt and thorns and stones. And yeah, so basically I quite badly lacerated my arms, both arms from the elbows down to the wrists. Little bits of stone and thorns and stuff being plucked out afterwards. And um, the guys in the in the in the platoon, like in the in the bungalow, said, "Should you better go down to the sick bay because it doesn't look good and it's likely to get infected." And I do remember sitting there going, "Yeah, I hope so. I hope it gets infected, and I hope I get really sick, and then they can deal with the consequences." It was just, you know, really bad headspace I was in. Um, stupid, childish, perhaps. Anyway, it healed up. I was fine. And um, shortly after that, um, a rumor circulated that because our basic training had been so poor or inadequate, a decision had been made to transfer, I think, the G1, K1 guys, not the G4 or the sick lamb and lazy, only the, the physically fit ones, to be transferred to, I think it is Aitsai, which is in Uppington. They apparently have a July intake, and the plan was these 30 or 40 or 50 guys who were physically fit for this, they do basics over again, do it properly this time, which I thought was horrifying. It sounded like a terrible idea, but you know, you always hear, you always hear rumors, and you never know if it's true or not, but it, it was the prospect was not good. Um, but even worse was the thought that if they managed to lose one signal between three side and four side for me to go on application, they're probably going to lose this signal for the transfer. And all four of us started to panic. Eh? And um, we, we did what 18-year-olds do. We picked up the phone and phoned their parents. This is not good. You need to get us out of here. And so... <laughs> Basically, what happened is all of our parents <laughs> phoned this guy, Captain Kutsio, who was in charge of the um, of the pilot's training um, schedule, if you will. And very quickly after that, we got transfers. And um, we were just elated to be out of there. Um, you know, we thought we'd dodged a bullet. And um, we said goodbye, and we were gone. And that was it. No love lost. And um, we arrived at Valhalla. We were sent to Valhalla, the Air Force Gymnasium. And um, it didn't go too well. We were called into a meeting and this guy came, this Captain Kutsio was there and he addressed us and he basically named us, all four of us, going, why am I getting phone calls from your parents and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, all right, whatever. Um and that passed, and then we were put on the parade ground, and we were given a very thorough um, drill session by the company sergeant major, which in the Air Force is um, a warrant officer. And uh, I think the problem was our basics were so bad, <laughs> most of the stuff we didn't understand. I've never heard of skeins, lungs, rechts, whatever. What the hell is that? And so it just was a mess. Um, I think some of the other guys who come from the other units who had done proper basics with a were in with us. They were really angry, 
because what then happened is they said the major who was there was the squadron commander came out and said yep we had thought that you were unprepared to be part of this air force um, your poor performance demonstrates that is the case we have decided that for the next three months you will do basics over in the air force <laughs> and i just oh no some of the guys were just the hell in with us because eh? it was basically the four of us. There were a few others who weren't too crash hot either, but you know, it was really our fault. So at that point in time, the Air Force had a, um, they had a March, April, oh, sorry, April, May intake, I think it was for permanent force members, which is quite a small intake. There were probably no more than, if I had to guess, 200 guys in total, including us. So we were streamed into that and off we went with basics, version two um which i didn't think was possibly as bad as the army experience and i think it's probably because we'd gone through it again or before so we knew what we were in for um but i think possibly it probably was as bad but we just didn't really realize it it certainly was nothing like that infantry selection course um uh, basics that was horrendous in comparison um, and the emphasis was a little different in the air force there was more emphasis on drill a lot of emphasis on drill and the physical training side of it was more structured in the sense of there was a lot of um, pt where you would do uh, form up as a didn't have platoons we used to have flights and your flight would do pt maybe twice a day but um you did have the usual running around trees and crap and whatever you what you know very similar but what was interesting was um we weren't issued with any um uh, battle kit there was no staldak webbing javier none of that what we were issued with was a thing called a they called it an r3 which i've learned is in europe called a g3 rifle this thing i suspect they had somehow acquired from the portuguese when they exited either angola or um, mozambique because i have seen photographs of portuguese soldiers with these things but it's not a particularly inspiring weapon uh, it looks like a toy a child's play toy um, it's made out of stamped metal but the quality of it didn't seem particularly good and none of it fitted together properly like the, the there was play in the butt the butt actually a plastic butt moved the pistol grip felt odd and the front grip there was a bit of movement on it as well um and then the piece de resistance was these rifles came without cleaning kits so consequently we were told to put them on a rifle rack and leave them and they were never used for anything other than ceremonial drill purposes which was good we never we never used them for anything other than that i can tell you we went to the firing range or the shooting range once in air force basics only once and i think the part that impressed me was instead of going there in samuels or bedfords we went in buses we were bused to the shooting range it's the air force you know we do things properly and um, it was quite an amusing morning because we went on the firing line with these R3s. We were told to oil them because they hadn't been oiled, so we did. And I think I maybe squeezed off at best three or four rounds and the thing promptly jammed. And up and down the firing line, um, my peers were having similar experiences. And the, um, the PTIs had their hands full clearing stoppages. And none of us really were properly trained on the weapon, so no one really knew what to do. So he would come and take the weapon and clear it. And, I don't think you could call it a, a successful day. But anyway, we had discharged our weapons, followed by cleaning, which was interesting because there were no cleaning kits except a handful. So basically, um, I think our flight, we'd probably had the best two of them for 30 guys. And the two PTIs were like, they were essentially doing it for us because no one really quite knew how to do it properly. Um, so it was quite a, an unusual day. Anyway, that was my one and only experience on the rifle range in the Air Force. Um, other than that, I thought the experience was pretty good. Um, 
I don't know if it was because we were permanent force volunteers, but I did feel we were treated relatively well. Um, the one marked thing I noted was an improvement in the quality of the food. We were still eating off metal trays, the farpans, but the food was notably better. And there was more of it. So one of my memories of the, of the army was going to bed virtually every night hungry. I never had that experience in the Air Force. Um, we were properly fed. And the one thing that always struck a chord for me uh, on a personal note was the flight sergeant who was in command of, of the mess, the troops mess. Occasionally on some Sundays, not all the time, but some Sundays, his family would come in, like his wife, the Omar and the kids, and they would sort of serve, skip up for the troops and serve the troops. And I actually thought that was a really decent thing to do because, you know, it's their time, it's their Sunday, they don't have to be doing this, and yet they did. And I thought that was a really nice gesture. And I, I'd like to think the guys appreciated it. I probably didn't so much at the time, but you know, insight you think about it was a really decent thing to do. And um, yeah, the rest of it was pretty similar, I guess, to the army. Lots of inspections, um, but sort of the it was highly disciplined, but in a more kind of professional way. Um, the PTIs were mainly um, not national service. They were mainly proper um, uh, short service or, or standing force, permanent force members. And the other thing that always I remember quite clearly is our, um, our um, squadron sergeant major or warrant officer was um, an elderly in the in the in the Kirk, so in the NG Kirk. So he was a very uh, obviously a very devoted religious man, and did not take kindly to swearing. And he would take, he would become visibly quite angry if anybody used any expletive. So I thought that was possibly quite a good thing. You know, you don't really expect that sort of thing. Um, this went on for about three months. Um, unlike Army Basics, this had a hard cutoff. We finished sometime around about the middle of the year, June, July of 82, we had a really good passing out parade, the Air Force Band played, uh, we were in our blues, our step outs, it was quite an enjoyable experience, I thought, because you felt like you'd, you know, you'd ticked a box on the road of your career. You're probably going to note uh, throughout my, my story, I will reference food. Food plays a big thing for me. I like my food. And um, I think food in the military is always a measure of um, how good or bad the experience is. And at roughly this time, I discovered one of the most wonderful things I've ever eaten. So we had a little um, Sawi cafe there. And one night we went there and I discovered a thing called a fit cook burger, which coming from Cape Town, I'd never heard of before. But basically it's a, for those of you who are not from South Africa, it's a burger served on, well, basically on a donut, an unglazed, unsweetened donut. And it is a thing of joy. Um, it's difficult to articulate and explain, but that was just the bomb. And the other thing I noticed was, although we had parades for, for um, meals, uh, on the weekends, they would like appoint a bungalow bull. And the bungalow bull who was in charge of the bungalow, the troops, the section of flight or whatever, he'd be responsible for getting the guys up to go out, march up for dinner or lunch or whatever. The corporals basically, or the, or the Corporals and sergeants stuff basically disappeared on the weekend. It's not like the army. Sort of Friday at four o'clock it stops, um, and the weekends, although you didn't couldn't get out the camp, you were left alone. And so bungalow bill, he'd be responsible if to march you up. If, and if you didn't want to go have dinner, no one's going to force you. It wasn't like that during the week, right? It's different. So it was quite good. Anyway, um, we finished, and we had to wait. I think. Uh, a few months before we could transit into the Air Force College to start officer training. It was a couple of months, I think there was a gap. So um, at that time, we were used in whatever capacity the Air Force used, was required us to be, which was quite often attending parades. Uh, we marched at a number of parades. I do recall we went to Bloemfontein 
I forget who it was, but one of the state presidents, the older ones that passed away, uh, it was sort of August, around about this time in 82, we went down there by train and we participated in his funeral parade. And there was always some parade somewhere doing something. Um, and we did a lot of guard duty was the other thing. Um, and uh, it's quite funny, we had a swing pool there at the Air Force Gymnasium. And adjacent to the, the gym, there was um, like a room which had a sauna in it, hot sauna. And so if you were on guard duty in the early hours of the morning, there's always two of you. What we used to do is um, <laughs> the one guy would stand outside and the other one would go in and you'd get like 10 minutes in the sauna just to warm up and then you'd like rotate whistle, you know, and then if the corporal did come, you'd call out, you know, whatever. But, um, yeah, it was um, it was what it was, right? Um, never slept on guard duty, but, you know, if you could make it more comfortable for yourself, you would. Um, I always wondered what you would do if an assailant broke into the base and attacked you because I had no confidence in that the weapon would fire and it certainly was not the type of thing you could club them on the head with because it would just break apart like a toy. So maybe maybe the regular jour was to use foul language or I don't know, but anyway. And um, I think at that point too, uh, we were allowed basically freedom of movement. So you could leave the camp uh, after four o'clock, 4.30. And basically everyone just did their own thing. Like in the evenings, guys went out, we used to go to movies, did what we wanted. Um, I um, I do recall we would quite often go out to Pretoria and catch a film or do what we wanted. It was quite a good time. And uh, we saw one particular movie. It was like a horror film, I remember. I don't, I don't really like those sort of films. But, you know, I'm just like, oh, I can't even watch a horror film. No. Got back and um, it was to do with werewolves or something. It was quite, I thought the thing was quite frightening. And... Um, a few days later, I remember in the bungalow, we were sleeping early hours of the morning, and I heard this like scratching noise by the door, like someone knocking. And I just ignored it, and they said, who's there? Vistar, who's at the door? And I said, just leave it, man. And it persisted. And then one of my peers, one of my colleagues said, Kuma, you're closest to the door. Just go have a look what it is, man. So I got up, and I opened the door, and I did the Vistar. And I just saw out of my right side, at the bottom, I saw movement. It's dark. And all I could see was what looked to me like a wolf's head. Uh, it was actually a yuckles, but I'll give you the context. And of course, I screamed like a little bitch and jumped back and ran and hid. And they all laughed at me. And basically, this guy stuck his head around the corner holding a yuckles head. And they'd set up a prank just to, like, you know, pick on me. So I'm quite often the butt of jokes. I don't mind. I enjoy laughing. I like making other people laugh. So that's all right. It was quite funny, though. Anyway, uh, time passed, and we went across to the Air Force College to start uh, officers training, which, again, was a three-month module or block of training. And unusually, we arrived on a Friday. And that is unusual, because normally things start on a Monday in the military. And um, we arrived there Friday morning. and. Uh, the, the morning part was pretty routine and administrative geared. You clawed in, got trommels and whatever you were required to get and billeted. And then I think lunchtime arrived 12, 12.30, and then it was like a light switch. And this thing called Operation Hocha began. And Operation Hocha is uh, your induction into officer training where you basically have a very bad time for about a day and a half. This involved no meals. Uh, I think the only food we got was Millipup, um, water. I don't think we got coffee or tea, but we were basically just given a miniaturized version of basic training all over again with sleep deprivation. So you weren't able to sleep at night. They came around at every two hours or so and basically made your life difficult and this went on and on and on throughout Saturday went on through Sunday and then I think in the afternoon late in the afternoon they said okay it's done finished welcome to officer training okay now you know what you can expect and um, off we went to start officer training which 
um, I don't think the physical side of it was any, anything worse than what we had been through. But it was far more interesting because you now had formal classes learning about the administrative side of the Air Force. Um, I think we did a module in military law. We learned all about um, military administration and writing, how to write um, military documents, sit reps, int reps, whatever was required. You were taught and learned that. Um, and it was it was different. And I think that's the part that was quite appealing, is it felt like you were doing something of value as opposed to running around from one bush to another with a rifle above your head or whatever it is you were doing. Um, also, again, the draw component, big part of it. Uh, again, we need to pause and look at the food. Uh, again, a marked improvement. And this time we now had uh, plates and cutlery. And I suppose the most exciting part was we were now were officially officer candidates or COs. And what that entailed was wearing a white strap around your hat and little white plastic strips on your epaulets, which you might think is quite a good thing because, you know, you're now in the zone. You're halfway getting to where you need to be. But in actual fact, it's quite the reverse. Uh, it's arguably the lowest rank in the military, officer candidate. And to give you some context, there's a standing joke that in terms of the disciplinary procedure, um, the officer will vent his fury on the NCO, who in turn will take it out on the troop. The troop will kick the dog and the dog will bite the CO. So you know very clearly where you are in the pecking order. And the problem with the bloody Air Force is because you've got that stupid white strap on your hat, you stand out like you know what. So, yeah, anyway. So um, the course itself, I, I actually quite enjoy. I think we all enjoyed it. It was quite good. Um, there were obviously pilots, pilot trainees. There were probably 50 to 60 guys who were mustered as pilots or pilot trainees. And quite a large, maybe as, not as many, but a large number of guys who were permanent force uh, in other disciplines within the Air Force, be it logistics or operations or intelligence or, or whatever the other field might be. Uh, quite a few guys in comops in my flight. So comops are communication operations, which is, I think, a subset of intelligence where basically um, it's like, call it PR. Air Force PR, for want of a better word. So it was quite a diverse group of guys, good group of guys. We got along very well. Um, and we did occasionally go on route marches. And the purpose of the route marches were to prepare for, uh, which I think they called adventure training. And adventure training was near the tail end of the three months where we went out to the Eastern Transvaal in buses, of course, not in trucks. And uh, funnily enough, we stopped at Middleburg to refuel. I have a photograph of it that you can see there. I'm standing there with my back to the camera, which was for me quite nice going back there, you know, not having to <laughs> do it, not being in the same position I had been before. And uh, off we went to the Eastern Transvaal. I don't recall the area. Um, but it was in fairly mountainous areas. I've got a funny feeling it may have been adjacent to the Bladder River Canyon area, or in that area. There's a mountain range there before before the high felt ends. It dra dramatically drops down to the low felt. Um, we're around about somewhere there, and we, for about a week, we um, did route marches uh, up and down in the mountains and that was quite strenuous it was also really enjoyable the, the countryside was absolutely amazing and um, the other part I really liked was the um, our lieutenants and our captain in charge of our um, flight joined us they they didn't not participate they marched with us um, which was I thought pretty good uh, it was real leadership from the front and there was a good sort of sense of camaraderie and um, it, it was, you know, maybe it's 40 years later, but it seems to stay in my mind that it was a good experience. And we had a nice, nice braai barbecue at the end, and they shouted us a couple of beers, which was really lekker. I really enjoyed that. 
And then we sat exams. We had to write several exam modules before passing out, uh, which, again, we had a passing out parade. Um, and I think a, f a few guys either did voluntarily fall off the course or were taken off the course, but they were few and far between. And I think it probably says something for the element of the selection course, but I think it's also as a reflection on the quality of the course, that it was done in such a way that um, you, if you applied yourself, you'd have to be thick as proverbial to get thrown off. It wasn't that hard, you just had to make an effort. So it was quite a good experience. I quite enjoyed it. And um, so this takes us up to roughly the tail end of 82. There was a very brief period of mulling around for maybe a few weeks, maybe a month before we got leave for Christmas. I got home for Christmas, which was really awesome. And I, of course, by now, we had all remustered as permanent force members, right? So that meant we were entitled to uh, the same privileges, which meant you received, I think, 20 days annual leave. So we were told you had to take two weeks off, and we went down, I went home, had a great summer, it was nice for two weeks. Came back, and we had to report to Central Flying School Donata, which is in uh, just adjacent to Springs. So it's basically where, I guess, the RAND, if you will, or PWV as it was then, Pretoria, Witzwaterrand, Witzwaterrand, Freenachen, ends. Basically, that's kind of the end of it. It's a big industrial town, Springs. Those of you who you know, live in the Transvaal will know this. And Donata is, uh, is the home, or was rather, the home for primary flight instruction. So this is where you started your journey as a pilot, the actual flying. And um, so we reported there on due course, and we were, after being clawed in and do the administrative work, we were assigned to our flights. So there were three pilot flights. There was Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie, roughly an equal distribution of guys. And the first two months, I think it was, were geared to, I guess, non-flying activities. So there were three modules in that. Um, there was um, a survival course. A parachute training course, and then a basic introduction to airmanship and understanding how an airfield works and what are the things you can expect. So basically, we rotated it. So each one of the flights did one of the modules um, at that point in time. I think, of course, I think our first module was, um, we were the first ones to do the parachute training component. and. Um, yeah, the DAC a DC-3 came in at Dakota, came up from Bloom, picked us up. I think there were about 18 or 20 of us. We all jumped in. It was quite exciting. None of us had been in a military aircraft before, so this was super awesome. And um, they ferried us down or flew us down to Bloom. Uh, I had a little Kodak Instamatic 35mm camera. I've got a photograph here of the flight deck of the DAC. The pilots knew, you know, we were recruits and they were actually really cool. They let the guys come through to, on the flight deck and, and as long as you didn't touch anything or disturb them, you could take all the photographs you wanted. So here's my photograph of a DC-3 flight deck. And uh, we arrived at Bloom. Um, so there actually there was, I don't know if it's still there, but there was an operational Air Force base called Bloomsprate at Bloemfontein. So we debussed there. Um, and the Air Force drove us from there to one parachute battalion where we would undertake, um, um, I was tempted to say a crash course, eh? but that would be a dreadful turn of phrase. Let's just say an intensive little training course, how to learn to jump out of a, a burning airplane, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, um, so we went in there and there was a bit of trepidation because we weren't quite sure how we'd be received. And Technically, they could they could treat us badly because we're just COs, we're not officers. So the guys were a little nervous about that, and everybody knew that paratroopers really had a tough time. Their training was very intensive. We knew all about running around with marbles and bricks and poles. 
And um, we were quite fearful that this would happen. But fortunately, it was completely the contrary to that. Um, we were in a bungalow, but we were kept completely separate from the troops. Um, and we ate in the officers' mess. There was like a separate sort of dining room, which I think they used for formal dinners and events and things. And we were we were served in there. Um, so that was quite good. They actually treated us pretty well. Um, we did do a bit of running around, but it was nothing really horrific. Um, I've got some photographs I'll share with you. You can see we did some training here. So we went into this hangar. And this is sort of the introductionary bit around um, understanding the mechanics of jumping in a parachute, hanging in a harness, what the drills are you need to do. And I think 40 odd years from now, sorry, 40 years on now, if you threw me out of an aeroplane, I still would remember what are the things to do. I remember this, there was like all this sort of command and stuff, and then you put your hands down, parachute up, you put your arms up, you hold the straps, you then had to sort of pivot in this harness, look up, look down, make sure everything was right and the canopy had opened and what have you. And um, and then there was a there was a specific way to land. So you had to slightly just hold your knees, your legs in, hop, just slightly bend your knees. And they had this, um, which you'll see in the photograph, this harness rigged where they would swing you from time from side to side. Your buddies would pull you on a rope and um, you were taught the proper procedure, how to land and not break an ankle or you know, walk away with as little um, damage to yourself um, as possible and presumably also as little damage as possible to their precious expensive parachute, which were not cheap. And um, we all did this, went through this, and this culminated a few days later in a visit to what's called the Arpkas, or in English, the ape cage. And you'll just see from the photographs, the cage is designed to replicate the experience of jumping out of an aircraft. And everybody got to do that two or three times. Um, it's quite intimidating, but I think after the first time, it's you're quite keen to do it again. It's quite an adrenaline rush. Um, also at the back of the Arpkas, there's a thing called, most of these things I know in Afrikaans, in English it's difficult. It's, never, it's called a vir, uh, a virkas or something. And basically what it is, it's, it's a rig that's attached to a harness and you jump out this thing and you fall. But as you fall, this thing's got a fan attached and the air resistance acts as a brake. So you fall at the same speed as you do out of an aircraft with a parachute. Um, so we did all of this. And I think at the end, everybody was really quite key to actually do a jump. They were up for it. But um, we were told, don't even entertain the idea. You're not allowed. Um, because if you did a jump and you twisted an ankle or whatever, you're off the course, which means they can't train you for another six months. So an actual jump is prohibited. Uh, we were, however, treated to attending a jump. There was a company of guys doing um, a mass jump. So the, um, the Air Force had a, um, it's actually a training unit of Dakotas at um, Bloom 86 Advanced Flying School. So the guys, the pilots who came on that conversion course onto multi-engine conversion, part of their training was to do para jumps or to take guys on para jumps rather. So it was we were treated to see this. I think we went to Tempe. The guys there, these trips all climbed on board there and the decks took them up and it was I think there were only three decks, but they flew in a formation. And these guys, um, we in the Air Force used to call them a uh, flace bomb or a meat bomb, which I know sounds horrible, but it's just a term of endearment. Um, and these guys went out the back and it was quite good fun to watch. It was like watching a war movie, you know, like those movies you used to see about Arnhem and D-Day and out these guys came. I've got a few photographs that I've shared here. You can see the guys there. One of the interesting points I thought was, um, these guys, so the standard non-steerable bog standard army parachute, I think is about 35 feet in diameter. So it's, it's a fairly generous bit of canopy. 
And I think the reason for that is because when you jump, you've got not only yourself, but they jump with a lot of kit, right? So they've got weapons and they've also got um, ammunition, supplies, and quite often the guys, as I understand it, would jump with auxiliary ammunition for light weapons like mortars, 60 more mortars and belts of ammo for the mag or whatever. So they're quite heavily laden. So I think it's probably the reason why the canopy was so big. Now, they also carry on their chest a reserve or emergency chute. And as I understand it, what they would do is you're supposed to, if, you're, if your main chute doesn't open, which I understand actually never happened. They never had a problem with it. But if it did, you had a reserve chute and you were supposed to undo, you were like flaps that or harnesses that you could unhook the main chute. They would do that and then they would have underneath hanging from their harness, they would have their kit. They could cut that away as well, just flick a switch or whatever and it would fall. And then they'd manually pull, um, pull the line to open the reserve chute on their chest which is a smaller parachute. That's about 24 feet in diameter. Now, interesting in the Air Force, the Air Force don't operate that big 35-foot chute. They only use the smaller one, the 24-foot one. And unlike the Army guys where it's on the, obviously on the chest, in the Air Force, it's basically on your butt. You sit on it in the plane. So all of these things, you know, a small parachute, no reserve chute in the Air Force, were strong incentives to stay with the aeroplane. We thought it was quite bemusing that adult sane human beings would jump out of a perfectly serviceable plane to get shot at on the ground. But to their absolute courage, they did it. So that was a highlight, watching these guys do their thing. I actually really enjoyed it. Of course, I must at this point segue back to something that in my um, verbal ramblings I skipped, and I feel it is important that I should come back to, which was uh, my passing out at uh, officer training. Apart from the parade, which was a really cool event, we, had our, we were introduced to our first military Air Force formal dinner. And this was to celebrate our passing um, of the course. And um, officer formal dinners are very colourful affairs. Um, they're highly enjoyable, good camaraderie, um, much humour, and copious amounts of different kinds of alcohol. And to set the scene, this typically starts off with you congregating in what's called the ante room, which is where everyone meets. Uh, and I think sherry is the starting point. Everybody has sherries. And everybody has quite a few sherries. And then we go through and the evening starts and it's a five or six course meal. But of course, each meal is accompanied by its own alcohol. And again, really good food, first class, lovely evening. But as the night progresses um, and the alcohol begins to take effect, the master of the mess or the master of ceremony, I think he's called the master of the mess, which is normally the OC, the colonel or whatever, he dictates what and what is and isn't permissible. So, for example, if you need to go to the toilet during the course, it's at his discretion. And if he chooses to let you go, there's normally a penalty of sort, which involves downing some alcoholic beverage. Uh, along with this, every possible opportunity is taken to toast every previous state president general in the Air Force, general in the Army, admiral in the Navy, and probably general in the medics. And if the alcohol and the time allows it, will cascade into the police force. And any other individual you may choose to nominate is toasted. And the toast is a serious thing. You drink it. You're not supposed not to. And then there's all kinds of etiquette that have to be followed. So one of the etiquette is passing the port, and I don't remember, from right to left. And if you pass it the wrong way, they have sort of disciplinary masters appointed by the OC, the colonel or whatever, and they will catch you and then you have to drink another drink. And anyway, so by the time one gets to dessert, um, it's out of control and in a good way. And sitting opposite me was a young lieutenant, a second lieutenant national serviceman who was one of the uh, instructors, funny enough, at, um, at the college. 
and we were enjoying our dessert and I, I was looking down and enjoying it and suddenly this um, ball of, let's call it matter, landed squarely in my dessert and across my tunic. And I looked up and this young loot was looking at me with what had gone down had come up, sort of dribbling off his face with this stupid smile going, I'm so sorry, just send me the dry cleaning ball. So um, that was the highlight of the evening. I was, I think we were allowed out. He was thrown out and I was allowed out and the mess servants wiped off my tunic and, and what have you. And, Do you want another dessert? No, no, I'm fine. I'm done. So that was, sorry, man, I just dropped off there. Um, so that was, um, sorry, I forgot about that, but it was an eventful evening and very enjoyable. So sorry, back to um, parachute training. Um, so that took about a week and a half. Really quite enjoyed that. And then we went back. Uh, we changed. The deck flew us back. And then they picked up the other flight. And they, we rotated with that flight to go to Pretoria to Fort Trekkerhoogda to the SA Medical School. And this was to do our basic introduction to Air Force survival. And the course was hosted by, I think it's Seven Sam's Medical Battalion, I think it is. And, and essentially, this um, unit is responsible for the training and deployment of ops medics and combat doctors. So these are the guys who actually go out in the front line to care and um, tend to the wounded in combat. Um, so we arrived there and the actual the course itself which is quite interesting is not conducted by the medics it's actually conducted by the reconnaissance commander and there were two officers there was a major and i think it's either a loot or a captain i can't remember but um they never said hey we're from the reconnaissance commander but everyone was going oh they're reckies they're reckies they don't know. And, but although they were in sam's uniform that was you know they were told these are reckies it's quite exciting so this was broken into two modules two weeks the first week is theoretical and again really interesting we got lectures from air force pilots um one that stood out for me was a, a young, he wasn't young, he was a, a, a very experienced uh, Impala pilot who was actually French. I think his surname was Fuss, Major Fuss. Uh, everyone called him Hubs Fuss, but it wasn't really his name. His name was Fuss. But anyway, and uh, the legend was he was actually a, a French Air Force Mirage pilot who apparently did an exchange to her and decided to stay in the Air Force. And he, he talked us through what typically happens in a search and rescue scenario when the Air Force lose an aircraft. Um, he talked about the kit you would have with you for survival. There's a thing called a Palba beacon, I think it was, which essentially sends out a signal and can be used as a two-way transmitter. And he explained how the different layers would perform, how, you know, uh, they'd put impalas in for top cover. There would be a Bosbok light aircraft for Telstar for radio relay. There would be, if required, um, I think they called it Reaximach, which was like a group of paratroopers who would come in and provide defensive cover if it was like a what they call a hot extract, if you were being chased or whatever. It's fascinating stuff because, you know, you're now learning parts of, of your training that are relevant. And um, I think everybody found it fascinating. And I certainly, I did. And they talked about what the equipment is you'd have. And they showed us, um, you had these pencil flares and first aid kits and uh, the Pelba beacon. Um, and it was all orientated about sort of survival in the bush. There was nothing to do about flying over the ocean. It was all about operational bush flying, or land flying rather. And part of the modules in the training was the, this alleged reconnaissance commando major. He did, um, he did uh, escape and evasion theoretical. 
but then he also did a bit on techniques to um, resist being interrogated, anti-interrogation. And that old adage about name, rank, and number is true. That's all you're supposed to tell them. Apparently, you can tell them your age, by the way. That's the other thing which is is, is okay. Um, which in my case would have gone badly because if I said I was a leaper, they'd probably think I was taking the mickey. But anyway. And um, one of the more interesting things that's always stuck in my mind, they actually said, don't try and be cute. Don't make up stories. Because he said, very quickly, you will wear yourself into a corner and you will start contradicting yourself without realizing it. And they said, all you need to do is just do name, rank, and number for 48 hours. Now, well, that is two days. And within two days, they can alter the scope and nature of a battle plan. That Whatever you know means nothing. And at that 48-hour mark, you should just blab. Tell them everything they want to know. Don't be smart. Don't keep your mouth shut. It'll just end badly for you. So I thought that was quite good advice. But they showed us some of the techniques that they use for interrogation. And none of it involved beating people or putting electrical wires on their private parts or anything. It's far more subtle and per pervasive and intimidating than, than that. Uh, it really was quite scary. Anyway, I won't go into that too much. Um, and we concluded that for a week and then on the Monday we went to do practical and uh, off we went to Hoodsprite and right on cue of course as usual we had to stop at Middleburg to refuel back we go <laughs> and um, we then drove to Air Force Base Hoodsprite and I think they just stopped there to refuel again uh, we debussed and then I think we climbed into these garries, these little Land Rovers, and they took us six at a time from Hoodsbred to a little game reserve called Glacieri, which is more or less adjacent to, well, not adjacent, but very close to Hoodsbred down the road. But it is adjacent to the Kruger National Park. It actually butts up to the Kruger National Park. And um, it's, it was certainly then very well stocked with wildlife. It's a private game reserve, but it was on more or less semi-permanent lease to the Defence Force. So, um, as I understood it, all, all military training that was required in a game reserve was done there for that environment for training. And so I've got a few photographs, which I'll share. You can see the guys here doing their thing, um, rough and ready. Uh, we stayed on the banks of the Glacieri River, which runs through the park. Uh, this was late January, early Feb. It was very dry, very hot. There had been a drought. So the temperature sort of skipped around 40, 41, 42 degrees every day. Very hot, very dry. And to start with, uh, we were issued, I think, each with a tin of be it bully beef or greens or vegetables and we had to share that for the day and as the course progressed through the week they just gave you less and less food uh, but what they did along with that was there were training modules on how you can live off the land you know so i've got a photograph here of guys cooking various bits of bush twig tree and god knows what else um, but apparently, apparently you can live off. Um, and then they also taught us how to find water in the sand in the dry riverbed. We dug out water, made a little water hut there, got it out. Um, we were also forced to eat various uh, insects, which are apparently nutritious. I've got a photograph here of one of my colleagues sticking a beetle in his mouth that you can see. Um, there was no choice involved. You had to do it, um, which we did. And then they shot an impala, a book, and they brought it into the camp. And of course, you look at this and you think, gee, I wonder if they're going to like have a bit of a bry, a little barbecue with this book. It would be really nice. 
Uh, well, not really. The box for them. What they have for us is they have a thing called penswater, which in English means literally stomach water. So what they did is they gutted the book and they pulled out the intestines and the stomach. And they cut open the tummy, the stomach of this book. And basically all that's in there is digestive juice, water and grass, because obviously the books love off the grass. And they proceeded to take this um, sort of looked like porridge almost. And they had a fire bucket, one of those army drinking fire buckets that you drink your coffee in. And they proceeded to start squeezing this into these fire buckets. There was more than one. Now, I should add at this point, apart from us doing this basic training, us young, inexperienced wannabe pupil pilots, there was a flanking course, a senior course or advanced course for fully trained pilots who were doing a more intensive, rigorous course, which had lots of escape and evasion elements, which we didn't do. And basically, the two courses were kept separate, except for some of the training modules. And this was one of them, what you can live off the land on. So the pilots joined us. And unlike us, they were in their flight overalls. So they were in like proper gear, what they would be in, in survival mode, I suppose. But anyway, they joined us for the for the um, for the Penswater experience. And one of the pilots, um, I'm not going to say his name because I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure it was his name. And if it is him, he's passed away from cancer. And I feel it's not right to say anything. But I've got his photograph. And if anybody knows him, you'll know who he is. And anyway, if this is his photograph, um, he I learned apparently I didn't see it, but apparently he threw up a bit of the stuff as everybody did. It was absolutely vile. Uh, it's disgusting got it on his hand, and he rubbed it on his butt on his flight overall, as you do. Anyway, we all had a swig of this, and I, I managed to, I noticed some of the guys before me were holding their noses, so I did that, so it wasn't too bad, but it certainly wasn't pleasant. And anyway, we were separate from the pilots. They slept in a separate bono in the bush to us. And then the next morning, we were told, no, this guy's been medevaced out, and essentially, this is the story I was told the next morning, but Apparently, a hyena came in the camp that night and bit him on his ass. And it must have smelt the pence vata on his flight overall and bit his butt. And all I know is he wasn't there. So there must be some truth in it. And I, I to this day, I think it must have been quite something to witness. I don't know who got the bigger fright, him or the, the hyena. Because, you know, uh, as I understand, a hyena can bite with tremendous pressure, can crush bone. So... I think he would have been probably quite fortunate just to have got a few teeth marks in his butt. But all I know is the guy was gone. And if there's anybody else who was on pilot's course 2 of 82 or on that officer's pilot's course, maybe you can verify or tell me um, I was told a pack of lies. Anyway, the, um, the uh, course culminated with us being dropped in the bush. We did some basic bush navigation and we had to find our way back to the Bono where the main camp was. Um, there was no food for two days and rationed water in a drought. And it's interesting to see how people's behavior becomes modified into such a base survival instinct, myself included. Um, I think they pushed it to a point where it was, you were really feeling it. Um, perpetually thirsty, all of your thinking is geared about one thing and one thing only, which is the acquisition of water. Nothing matters. And on one of these day marches, we came across a baobab tree, which apparently this tree is like well known in the game reserve. It's a massive tree and it's sort of like the grandfather of the trees in there. Very, very intimidating tree. And we basically marched past it and carried on trying to navigate our way through the bush. And the most remarkable thing happened about 50 to 55 minutes later, just under an hour, we came full circle back to the same tree. We'd walked a perfect circle. I don't know how we managed it. It did not bode well for our future navigation abilities. 
but morale just slumped and you know the guys got bitchy and having a go at each other and anyway this went on for some time we went a different direction and lo and behold we came across um, a small village of locals which we were surprised to find we didn't think there'd be any local population in the game reserve presumably they worked in the reserve um, I'd imagine there were a few sort of semi-permanent huts and buildings they gave us water thank god and the, I assume it was the headman he came out and sort of there was no ability to converse we couldn't speak whatever the dialect was and he couldn't manage a word of English or Afrikaans so I had a very cheap um, digital watch very cheap thing with a few rand so um, the guy said give him your watch give him your watch get a chicken and there were chickens running around so I'm trying to like we're trying to do this pluck, 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 trying to convince the old man to give us a chicken and he's shaking his head and he basically said, like, brought us sort of like sample millimeter or whatever, something. And I just, the guy said, just take it, give him the watch. So I gave him the watch. And we were honestly just about to sit down and eat this on cue. And the Gary rocks up with this Ricky major in it. And he let us have it. And you think, did you think we wouldn't know? Did you think we wouldn't find out? And obviously, this bloody herdsman, he, he was in contact with him, the walling goats. So um, it was quite late in the day. I remember they wouldn't let us out at night in the bush. Uh, he drove us back, and the next day we repeated the performance. Anyway, it, it culminated at that stage. Um, one of the highlights was, I think it was on the final morning, down the dry riverbed came a herd of, a um, small herd of elephant, which was quite an impressive thing to see, obviously looking for water as they walked down the, down the dry Klaseri River. Um, the day finished up and then they treated us to a braai in the evening. We had a lovely barbecue. But the funny thing was, after a week of very little to no food, no one wanted to eat. So I think it was a piece of burravos and a bit of bit of a bread roll and we were done. So couldn't eat anymore. Um, and then thankfully that was over. I didn't really enjoy it. Um, I, you know, Some people like being in the bush. I'm not one of them. You know? And um, I like a soft bed. I like room service. That's what I like. And um, that came to an end. It was followed by the third tranche of that training period, which was uh, introduction to airfield procedures and what happens on an airfield, how aircraft are directed, um, what the procedure looks like in a pattern for aircraft flying. Very basic, just um, high-level introduction. There was nothing really um, involved or intensive. Um, and so that two-month period ended and the three flights amalgamated back at Donata. And now officially we got on with the flying training program. And this was preceded with a month or so of ground school where you were taught various um, technical aspects of the aircraft. So back in those days, we were operating an aircraft called a Harvard, which were all World War II legacy aircraft. So um, some folk may be aware that during World War II, um, South Africa hosted something called the Empire Pilot Training Scheme, where all the Commonwealth crews from Britain, principally the UK, came to South Africa to do their basic primary and secondary flight training. And the reason for that was there was so much requirement to convert airfields and airspace in the UK into combat-related areas. So the training capabilities were all shifted out to two places. So South Africa did um, the basic elementary training, most of it, and Canada did the other element, which was mainly multi-engine training and the training of bomber crews for RAF Bomber Command. So as a consequence of the South Africa had many satellite um, air bases, but it had a lot of leftover Harvards. And some of those were acquired um, by the SAF. And I believe a lot of them were just left in storage after the war, which the South African Air Force um, either 
paid for or bought or was gifted, I don't know. But as the Air Force expanded in the 60s, these aircraft were brought back into service uh, en masse. And um, there was a large number of Harvards at, um, at Donata. Um, many of them were in hangar storage, um, not being used, but they did rotate them in and out of service. And uh, there were a couple of hangars, I remember, that were dedicated just to heavy maintenance on the aircraft. Um, it's Some of those aircraft dated from 1942. So you're talking about a 40-year-old aeroplane. Um, and I, I was quite intrigued by this. I often used to think, I wonder, you know, how many young guys in World War II would have climbed in this aircraft, gone to Europe and flown in combat over Germany or, you know, it's real legacy stuff. And to me, it's sort of, I don't know if the other guys felt that way, but I thought it was quite a, quite a bit of living history and it was something to be revered, you know, anyway. And um, so we did the ground school, this went on, so mainly around understanding the mechanical aspects of the aircraft, uh, basic navigational training, basic airmanship, and of course, aerodynamics were the main uh, principal um, uh, subjects in the curriculum. Um, and after that was concluded, there was a number of exams, of course, you had to set. Uh, once you pass those, the actual flight training began. Now, I should point out, throughout this process, various guys were falling out voluntarily. And I think it was a case of them going, this is not for me, this is not what I want to do. And they were changing their minds and people were leaving. And prior to us starting the flight training component, a number of guys who had been on officers course with us actually elected to resign and not continue as permanent force members. And they all defaulted back to national service. So I thought it was a peculiar thing. I didn't really understand their motivation, but nonetheless, everyone to their own. So at this point, we had guys really falling off, voluntarily walking away. And um, much to my excitement, the flying began. And this begins with an orientation flight around what's called the GF or general flying area and they teach you to recognize various navigational waypoints from the air principally towns so you get to see what springs looks like from the air Donato town nigel delmos there are a few other towns there and there's quite a few um coal-fired power stations there which were also used for reference points and i think there was a a fairly large or sizable um, farming irrigation dam in the general flying area, which they used. And anyway, and then the pace very rapidly picks up. Um, and rather uh, sadly for me, right from the get-go, I really struggled. And I think in hindsight, the problem was I was too young and too immature to be able to cope with it. I should have done what Jacques de Toy did. I should have done two years national service grown up a little bit, paused for a moment, and then think, is this what you want to do? And then apply. But I didn't. You know? And hindsight's a wonderful thing. But for me, it was a struggle. And um, the longer it continued, the greater the pressure and anxiety to perform to the required standard. And I had a little bit of air sickness as well. Um, we were told, air sickness, don't look in the cockpit, look out of the aircraft at the horizon. But I struggled to make that sort of mental adjustment between flying the aircraft, managing the workload, in other words, understanding the information on, uh, on, on the control panel in front of me, flying the aircraft and keeping my visual reference. I just, my brain could not, could not process the information quickly enough. That's how I felt anyway. And um, anyway, cut a long story short, I was given an instructor change because sometimes that helps. 
But I think at that stage, I really was starting, it was almost on the verge of panic, you know, like I, I can't do this and I'm really getting anxious over it. So at this point, you do a thing called an 18 hour check. And an 18 hour check is a waypoint where they determine whether you are competent to start your solo training. And solo training is to prepare you to be able to take off and land the aircraft in a circuit by yourself, which is obviously a big milestone, but you have to pass the 18 hour test. Now, um, the standard for passing is 60%. I was given two goes. I failed the first one and on the second one I got 58%. So I was 2% shy. That's fine. It is what it is. And um, I was suspended off the course. And although I was upset at it because I, in my life I'd wanted to do this, I was hugely relieved. I felt this massive weight taken off my shoulders and sort of the emotional pressure of it just went. And um, I think one of the things with military flying, particularly in the South African Air Force, was there just isn't the time to allow you to get to a point where you can go solo in your own time. It's not like civilian flying. Civilian flying, you're paying for it. And one of the things I did learn later in life is, in actual fact, and I know it because I do fly occasionally, anybody can fly a plane. It's actually not that hard. The plane actually wants to fly itself. It likes to fly and be in the air. But it's one thing to do it in a civilian uh, environment without the pressures. In a plane, by the way, which is like a Toyota Vitz or Toyota Echo, Harvard is none of those things. Harvard is a really monstrously overpowered beast of a machine. And it's designed to test you. And it's designed to test you early. And you need to keep pace. If you can't keep pace, you shouldn't be there. So I don't have any regrets that they did what they did. It was the right thing for me. And um, what to do, I suppose. And I was pretty much immediately uh, summoned in front of, I think it was, it wasn't the colonel of the base. It was the OC of the flying school, the commandant. And uh, he, and I think my flight, not my flying instructor, but the flight instructor was, I think it was a major. They called me into his office and they said, look, um, it's not the end of your career. He said, um, would you be interested in considering applying as a navigator? And he said, if you applied, you would have to go through a formal application process, but it's by and large a formality. You don't need to sit any tests. You don't need to go through the medical tests or sit in front of the selection board. Um, it, you'll basically just be um, remastered and put onto the navigator training element, which I think was hosted in those days down in Langebahnweg. And um, I think I think I was genuinely depressed at that time, and I felt so um, down, and everything looked black to me that I just went, I want out just let me resign i'll do my national service and i'm gone and i think in hindsight i should have at least have paused and considered the offer um and it's interesting because you never know where that might have led i have subsequently learned that a number of navigators in the air force did do several years and then convert back onto pilot scores but when you're 18 and a half and not in a good mental state. It's difficult to make informed, intelligent choices. And I think the other difficult thing is, you know, you don't have anybody to confide in. You don't have a mentor or someone older or senior where you can go, what's your advice? What do you think I should do at this point? But I did think to the credit of the Air Force, they at least gave me options. And I, I, I think that was um, you know, a testament to their professionalism that they tried and perhaps a reflection on my uh, stupidity not to consider it. Anyway. It is one thing which I think most people will agree with about basic training. You've mentioned all the things, and we're grateful for that. You know, the early hours, the cleaning, the sh but that's what I want to get to, the shouting. Do you recall a lot of shouting during basic training in both the Air Force as well as the Army? 
Um, I recall nothing else but shouting. Um, the army, it was just horrific. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the, the interesting point, looking back at it now, like the psychology of what they were applying, I think they were looking for one thing and one thing only. They wanted you to work as a well-oiled, capable, single machine. Um, and if you think about the application of what it is you're expected to do, you can see why it's, why it's critical. You need to get it right. And I think one of the remarkable things about that basic training is you go in there and it's just everybody is, it's, it's a great egalitarian society. Everybody is equal. You are all utterly useless. And I think to mold people, young men, in three months from that to where they are is quite a remarkable thing. And unfortunately, I think there's no other way to do it other than the way it's done. But um, I think even having a basic understanding of Afrikaans, I mean, we did Afrikaans at school, so I could understand it. But I do think one of the great things about the army in particular with training is you can understand at least a third of what's being said in Afrikaans because every third word is the F expletive. So you can basically get it together. But um, the, the, the other interesting thing was it was, uh, I've heard other people make comment of this and everyone knows that it's a standing joke, is it's meant to be multicultural. So you meant to do half English, half Afrikaans, but the standard narrative was, well, for the last 40 years, it's all been in English and we're in charge now. So for the next 40, it's going to be in Afrikaans. But um, it, it works. You know, that's the key thing. It works. Um, but I, I will say this much, the shouting and the swearing put aside, hand on heart, I never saw any member of the Defence Force lift a finger to strike a soldier or beat a soldier, it never happened. Um, and look, I can't comment for other armies. I don't know what the procedure is there, but I did think um, I did think there was something to be said for that. Um, yeah. So yes, a lot of shouting. The air force, not so much. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned that because I do tend to ask the English speaking people here if I felt discriminated against because of the language. I know that when I stood in uh, Port Elizabeth at the third generation parade, I was listening to the RSA and he was roaring out in English. And I can tell you now, I would not have been able to, to follow his instructions because it's, just, it's not instinct to me. Uh, so we, if, if you felt, you know that uh, these people have a grudge against you because of your English uh, background. No. I mean, there was a standing joke about, you know, there was a bit of, I call it healthy tension or friction. You know, you've got one side, you've got the Buddha, on the other side, you've got the also or this. Uh, I don't know if I can say it, but, you know, a soti, which is you've got one one foot in England, the other in South Africa, and your undercarriage gear dangles in the ocean, which I always thought, I know it's a joke, but I thought it was absurd, man. I, I you know, I'm a fourth generation European, South, fifth generation European South African. I've got absolutely nothing in common with the United Kingdom other than I speak English. And I, so I think it was all in light banter, but I think, I don't want to stray off the question, but I think there was a seriousness to it as well where, um, you have to consider it, I think, in the context of its point in time. And there was a threat. I think the government did everything in its power to make it as bad as it could be seen, which is arguably a good or a bad thing, whichever side of the ledger you want. But I think if they didn't, they would have been negligent in their duty. You had to really escalate the threat, and it was a threat. Um, and the other thing is, you know, coming from an English, and look, I think my family, well, certainly my dad was relatively liberal. I think in, in modern society, both my father and I would have been quite squarely labelled, and I know because the kids in the family, not my family, but the, 
my uh, nephews and nieces see me as a old right wing fart. Um, but certainly in South African context, I don't think my dad would have been seen that way. So we were, I wouldn't say liberal, liberal, but certainly I, I, my father would quite regularly on television take the mickey out of the government ministers, you know, because the, the SABC, the TV was basically just a, a channel for the government to exercise its voice. And my dad used to sit there and laugh and go, yeah, yeah, the minister said, the minister said. So basically what I'm trying to say is we, we were quite, liberal but to me in that sense but to me um the politics of the country and the situation on the border and the threat i actually didn't see them as the same thing and maybe that's wrong i don't know but i i there was no question in my mind whatsoever that you had a duty of care to perform and it wasn't really about I certainly didn't see it this way. It wasn't about going to the border to support um, an unfashionable political structure in apartheid. I did, I, to me, that had nothing to do with it. To me, it was about these were people who were coming to do harm and they were a threat. And at the end of the day, you're doing this really to protect your family. And people might look back at that and go, geez, that is really just childish and naive. But I would say, look at the rest of Africa. There was history behind there where um, post-colonialism change has without fail been violent. And you only have to look at the Belgium Congo where they were chopping off nuns' heads, for God's sake. And, you know, I just, it didn't look good. And it's not like, and let, you know, let me be clear, I don't have a British passport. I can't hop on a plane and go to England. I'm not from Rhodesia. I'm, just like any Afrikaner, I'm in the same boat. I have nowhere to go. So, you know, I, I've got skin in the game here. So, yeah, there was never any question of doubt in doing it and going. And by that, and that, that being said, um, those people who had a moral issue about it and didn't want to go and chose to do a lifestyle to avoid it, I, I don't begrudge them because they paid their own price for their conviction. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with it. Um, you know, you make your choices. But to me, you, you, yes, you had to go, but it was, it was the right thing to do. Yeah, you know, you're quite right. I was smiling now when you spoke about the ministers and being taken the wiki out. Uh, my father was a fairly liberal man because he came from a Jewish house. And, uh, of course, he ended up as a regional magistrate, the senior one, doing all the terrorism trolls. Very fairly as well, as fair as the laws of the day could allow, but uh, procedurally extremely fair. And when he went on retirement, he bought himself a dog and he called the dog Quibi. And that was after Quibi could see the Minister of Justice. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he was very, very attached to this dog Quibi and sadly he passed in 95 and Quibi went by a few, about three weeks later. And so we had oh. to marry Kirby as well. So um, he was close to Mr. Jack Russell. I, I was always in that school for, for asking why are we playing cricket, rugby, and tennis in our English sports, but soccer or bad because it's English. But you know, when you have a lot of history and you read a bit more than what you should at a young age, the teachers don't like you yeah. that much. But now I'm going to ask you a question. When, when you were at the um, officers' course, well, one of these things which you got taught, well, would that have been dancing? Like, in how to behave on a dancing floor? No, which was sadly, there was a, um, funnily enough, there was a, uh, an etiquette handbook uh, called An Officer and a Gentleman, I think it was, which had some basic guidelines and principles around how to conduct yourself. But I think when we did dancing, I must have been sick that day because I missed it. There they did it. Which would have been a good thing. I think many, uh, most young men should learn how to properly dance. You're going to use it at least once in your life if you're going to marry. You should know what you're doing. Um, to this day, I still can't dance. So I, I did miss out on that. <laughs> yes, I must say my wife, Rebecca, is quite, um, I would say, taken aback the fact that I'm an African without rhythm. Because, man, I've got no rhythm whatsoever. I can't dance. I don't want to dance in <laughs> And that's it. 
But now I want to You're not alive. Yeah, yeah, it's not for me, man. I've got two left feet. But my mom was actually a very good dance queen. Like, uh, she was at this author, Murray. Dance oh, queen. yes. She was in Stockholm. Yes, Arthur Murray. Um, and yeah. In the young days, of course, before she, she kind of happy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, no, so she could really dance well. And she did talk my dad a few, few steps. But for me, no, I'm fairly useless. So I'll let my dad. <laughs> <laughs> but but Chris, I want to take you to your first flight in the Harvard, that orientation flight. Uh, I, I was I was married uh, because she's late now. She passed um, to an aviator. Uh, she flew fast. <clears throat> she flew fast jets actually for the U.S. Navy. She was F eighteen qualified, super ordered. Wow. Um, she was fantastic. Wow. Really, we were really close for eight days. We went to give her before before the sadness started. Now, she used to threaten me always to say, I can go with her, um, because she had access to an F-14, to a Tomcat, because she would fly around to do her, her job. She wasn't in the Navy, but by that time she's already retired mm. after 20 years as, a, as an officer. If you're not uh, promoted, you, you, you get on off plane, you have to go. And she was programming the... Naval flight simulator, so it meant that she had to sometimes get to our wife quite quickly, and then she would just take a 14 and as she said, go oh. off the burner and you would refuel quite a few times, but you get there quite quickly. So I was very excited because he said I could go with on condition that I can pass uh, the Navy's um, survival and parachuting, you know, ejecting that type of thing, which I was very confident I could do. But she said to me that she was very serious. She had the unholy glint in her eyes. And she said to me in the first place, when she's doing three flights, I don't talk to her. Mm. She'll get one and if I talk to her. And secondly, I sit on my hands and I touch nothing. I don't even think of touching anything. And if I don't behave, she will do things on that aircraft which will make a circus train multi crop. Okay, but we never got the chance, and thank God for that too. So now I'm asking you, Chris, when you got into that aircraft of the instructor room, was it like that at all, or was it more decent? Um, no, I think it was more towards the latter. Don't touch, don't do. Put your hands in your lap. Um, just, you do nothing. Um but it was, I think that the, the tone was set right from that first flight. I remember him saying, where are we now? What's that town there? And I'm like, how the hell would I know? And, you know, it was, it just set the scene that the pressure was on right from the start. Eh? And um, I think we did that one hour orientation flight. And then the next flight was you started basic flight controls. And although you're not flying the thing, you were expected to do all the pre-flight work. Uh, and it's quite considerable. Um, it's a lot more than people can, can actually realize. Um, and part of the pre-flight is external, where you actually expect to inspect the condition of the aircraft. And he got me once a good shot. What he did is he put a pen in the engine cowling, you know, this, this big radial 550 horsepower engine and he dropped a pin in the cowling and I didn't look properly and he let me have it rightly so you know it's a serious matter um so you know I think right from the second flight you were doing all, all the um the basic pre-flight checks not only on the external parts of the aircraft but to prepare the aircraft for flight um, I really can't remember, you know, 40 odd years ago, the sequence of events, but um, there were a number of things you had to do to check things like there were each engine's got two magnetos. You've got to check when you start the engine, check for magneto drop. You've got to check the fuel pressure, the oil pressure. Um, you've got to check that the instruments are all working. You've got to set the Q&H, which is sets the altimeter because it's dependent on the air pressure of the day. And that's actually critically important because if that's not set, you're flying to the ground when you're landing the aircraft. You know? So all of those things are important. And then um, 
I think to give you some context as well, that aircraft, the Harvard in World War II, was not seen as a basic trainer. The guys would normally use, if you were in the RAF, you would train in something like a Tiger Moth first. Or if you're in the United States Army Air Force, you train on a cadet biplane first. And then you would transition in your second phase onto the Harvard. The Air Force, it was none of that. You were straight in. And I think I think the strategy behind it or the policy was that if you can essentially master this aircraft, there's very little you're not going to be able to fly in the Air Force. And you, you can see how that's a sound policy to apply. But the other thing to bear in mind on that aircraft is um, it's what's called a tail dragger. So in other words, um, unlike modern aircraft, it's, um, it sits on its backside where it's got a, um, a wheel in the tail and it sits on its bum like that. So what that actually means is you have a whole raft of other complexities to work around that you don't have in a modern aircraft, modern aircrafts in a tricycle, tricycle configuration and what those things are is when you taxi the aircraft you can't taxi in a straight line you have to use the rudders to swerve and look out the aircraft and you have to be aware of that um, you also have to be aware that um, when you take off and the aircraft rolls the torque of the engine it's so powerful that of course the torque wants to steer the aircraft in the opposite direction so you've got to feed in I think it is right rudder to compensate to keep the aircraft going straight. So you and it, when I say you have to apply rudder, it's not a gentle, benign uh, application. You've got to pump it, really push it in. It's a very robust input. So at a certain speed, I forget the speed, the, the nose of the aircraft, or rather the tail, will elevate to a horizontal position. But as the aircraft goes through this movement, that the, the force of the movement again makes the aircraft want to go left. So not only are you pumping in rudder for the torque of the engine, you now got to pump in more. And then at the same time, the airflow coming down the fuselage from the engine is applying a force or a pressure on the tail. And it's applying it in such a way that the again, the, the tail is going right with the airflow so the nose is coming left so you've got three powerful forces trying to pull you off course so you've got to manage this you've got to keep a visual eye on where you are on the runway you've got to keep an eye on what the instruments are doing at the airspeed in particular so that you know at the correct speed that you apply pressure to bring the aircraft off um, the other interesting thing about Donata it's not like a modern airfield or airport it doesn't have um, sealed runways it's one great big grass field and what they do is they actually they have six runways three parallel and another three parallel which dissect so that you can have a, a 360 degree operation on the field depending on the weather direction but they're not readily visible you actually have to see these white sort of markers on the side so you know it's there's nothing visual to cue you that you're on the runway as well. So all of these inputs are happening at the same time. And um, as soon as the aircraft leaves the ground, you have a thing called, I think it's called 50 foot vital actions. Um, where you have to basically apply the brakes, uh, bring up the undercarriage, um, make various adjustments on the throttle settings. And the other thing too, which is fascinating is on the aircraft, it's not one lever. There's actually three, there's a throttle, a mixture and a pitch. Uh, and the throttle is self-explanatory, right? But what the mixture lever does is, depending on the altitude of the aircraft above ground level, it will either lean or enrich the fuel mixture, that is the amount of air and fuel being mixed, and it does it to give you better efficiency in terms of the performance of the aircraft, particularly around range. But then also you have a third lever or knob, which you're also working, which is called the pitch. And the pitch refers to the angle of the propeller. And the propeller actually moves around an axis or the hub. And the purpose of that is um, at lower speeds, it's either coarse or it's fine. I can't remember. I think lower speeds is coarse. And it's designed to give better bite into the airflow to make the aircraft perform better at low speed. 
And when you are at speed, you then manually have to adjust it to fine pitch. So you've got all these variable things happening at the same time. And um, you really, you really, and you need to learn it quickly. There just isn't room to go, don't worry, we'll do it tomorrow. Um, yeah. Sorry, it's a long winded question, answer to your question. No, it's fascinating. I mean, how many of us has ever been in orbit? We've seen the things droning around. If you live in the northern area in those days, it really drove you nuts. But I always thought of the poor youngsters in there, you know, with the instructor breathing on their necks. And, uh, and you know what? If you want to be an Air Force pilot or a naval aviator, man, you better. Have. That, that training is essential. It's not just taking off and landing. You have to do things for that aircraft. Uh, but we can talk about this for hours, but I think we did talk for hours now. And so we will uh, we will let it go here, but to all of you out there, there's another episode coming. Uh, perhaps even more than one, but, but definitely another one. We are very grateful for you, Chris. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, anybody, if you're listening here, please contact me. If you have a story to tell us, don't hesitate. You know what? You just come on. We're having fun. We drink our rooibos here in between. You drink your coffee or whatever. I've seen the Air Force uh, helicopter jocks, the other guys are having all of them buy wine and beer, but, you know, each to his own. I don't want. And until we meet again, God bless.